All right, all right, all right. Salam on that. Salam on alaikum to you. Alaikum salam, sir. Uh -huh. Certainly great to be with you here this morning. And um, so, yeah, um, I tell you, uh, I um, have been doing some uh, reading and studying and reflections. And I wanted to, as like I said, have uh, time to discuss a few things with you. Uh, so uh, I'm ready to start whenever you uh, Oh, I'm ready. ready. I'm, I'm all ears. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I've been thinking about, uh, I, I like the title of this session is uh, Satan's Last Stand. Okay. Okay. And um, what I was uh, thinking about in, in, in reflecting on that, when we look at the um, African American experience, uh, looking at um, slavery, um, the descendants of slaves, the enslaved and the descendants of, of the slaves, and that whole experience. Um, and reflecting on that in light of what um, the source creator has said in the Quran, there are several uh, ayats that I was reflecting on. One ayat is where, um, you know, Allah says, uh, in giving us that description of the, uh, the Iblis or the Satan said, I will allow, wait, you know, so now that you have um, set me out, mm -hmm. you know, I will allow, wait for them, you know, in ambush. Mm -hmm. I will come to before them, in the front of them, to the mm -hmm. behind them, to the left of them, to the right of them. Yeah. And uh, the Arabic word that uh, described that ambush is ka'ada, uh, which is the verb, for, in its verb form, Mm -hmm. And the noun form, that word is koed, um, which means language, grammar, you know, foundation. Yeah, beautiful. So, and then he says that uh, he will establish himself, you know, in God's way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's very, very foundational or fundamental to for us to understand, you know, where we are today. And in, in, in th my thinking, uh, with the, with the uh, what the creator allowed in American form of slavery, uh, I believe that what happened uh, in that uh, system of slavery I think of, uh, that what we call Satan, the devil, or Shaitan can be summed up better, a better description for this conversation. I want to call him, call him the slave makers. Because really, um, what we know as Imam Muhammad, you know, pointed out, what was done to the uh, enslaved people really was prototypical of what they had planned for the whole of humanity. And most people don't understand that slavery is, is a system, it was a, a system that was perfected. They took every lesson that they could from history, from human history, and they incorporated that you know, in the American system of slavery. And so I believe that um, what I call, what I'm calling Satan's last stand is that um, a lot allowed this to happen so that he could bring an end to the reign of the slave makers. Okay, so, um, what I'm, I'm I'm thinking in in, th in terms of 
how the human being, they understood, these slave makers clearly understood how the human being is constructed. And so in their system, for an example, I was lo looking to looking at the session that you was doing with Adam Ambush and mm -hmm. the the uh, triune brain. And when we look at the triune brain, you know, the 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 uh, lizard brain or the aura complex, the mammalian brain, and the neocortex. <clears throat> so slavery had its focus, American slavery had its focus on totally wiping out the limpic uh, or, or the mammalian brain of the enslaved people. That's very key that we understand that because um, what the slave makers objective was and is, is to reduce everybody back to the lizard brain. That's slavery. And, and so when you wipe out, if you wipe out a people's, all of their emotional attachments and memory of positive things in their history, you, you totally wipe that out. Language, you know, everything is, is totally, you know, taken off the, the, the memory chip. And so what happens to me, uh, what happens in my thinking is that that, as you pointed out, is really the, the, uh, the foundation or the, the base for the limpic, uh, for the neocortex activities. So what, uh, what is happening in the aftermath of the slavery is what I call mental dodgeball. And this is basically what, you know, is happening. What we call thinking is not thinking. It's meant we are all, we know what we are against, but we never know what we are for. Because the, the, the mental activity that we engage in is not fit for base. And so this is what the slave makers understood. Uh, and one of the things that what we are learning in, in nunetics is that when we think of language, where, where Allah says that the human being evolves or grows from the earth as a plant, the nabat. And in that, when we study the plant and how it grows, the plant has an intimate relationship or the, uh, 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 or the seed probably where the plant comes from has an intimate relationship with the soil that we can say soul. And in that intimate relationship, that seed goes down in an involutionary development before it comes up in an evolutionary development. Mm -hmm. Now, in that evolutionary development, the, the seed uh, in, the, in, in the Mother Earth. I'm sorry, give me one second. Get my picture back. My camera's been acting up a little bit. Okay. I think that should be Okay. All right. Continue. Okay, so um, my thing is that the seed uh, in, in, in the embryo that which is, you know, has the, the genetic uh, code for establishing a real connection with, um, with nature. Uh, for an example, as what we know is that the one of the first letters, the first Arabic letter, Aleph. Okay, to me, and studying that, we know that there is a relationship between the spine and the human being, you know, and the sound that it was first uttered uh, in establishing that relationship, knowing that relationship, knowing that there are only seven sounds that can be emanated from the human mouth. So 
what I'm my thinking is that um, this, when we understand language, uh, this is the as we drill down in 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 the uh, relationship with the environment, with 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 what's going on inside of us, and I think this is why genetics is so important because it establishes a relationship between every uh, between the parts in the human body with what's going on in the environment. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so in order for us to get to the neocortex of the rational or the, the part of, of thinking, it ha we have to have uh, that relationship. So the evolutionary process uh, that's going on in language helps us to then, uh, first of all, be grounded in our own reality. Uh, and then, because this is what the seed does, it grounds itself, it anchors itself, you know, in Mother Earth. So the, the seed letters help us to anchor the soul, uh, like soul, in the reality of, uh, of the fitra of Allah. So that's the, you know, that's the thinking. And so uh, my belief is that when we think of things like why there is no unity among, you know, really the human being in general, but particularly among African Americans, is because the that critical part, you know, of the of, of development and understanding how language, you know, uh, grounds us is uh, has been wiped out. We we, we don't really see that uh, as we should. And so as the law tells us in the Quran uh, over and over that thicker of law is the Akbar. It, that is the only Akbar, that is the great. Thinking on Allah. And, and when we think on um, in, in this way, it allows us to come back to some um, sense of reality about who we are and, and then allow us to be really grounded again in our own reality. So um, <clears throat> there are some other things uh, uh, that I had in mind. I, and I, I just want to get some uh, feedback from you on what I... Okay. Uh, I need for you to explain a term that you used uh, at least twice, involutionary. Yes, sir. And compare it with what is evolutionary. Okay. Involutionary... Uh, is the that which goes on internally, that development that goes on internally, and it is the first uh, form, you know, of our development. It is necessary because I heard once a statement that before you can become a part of something else, you must first become whole within yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> evolution uh, is a uh, is a part of that process where we are becoming whole within or on the inside within ourselves. And then once that happens, then for an example, the plant, when it invo uh, involved in this evolutionary process, it, it goes down and, and, and becomes um, rooted. And then when it uh, comes out of the earth, now it's ready for social you know, uh, uh, activity and involved mm -hmm. with uh, other life forms. Beautiful. Because until it becomes whole, it has no basis for to interact. And look at what it does. It comes out and in social activity, it's giving out something that's very necessary for other life forms, oxygen and other things and minerals. So evolution is very important uh, before we can... Uh, be ready and fit for the evolution uh, that is necessary to have that social interaction. That's very well put. <clears throat> Involutionary involves the involving yes, sir. of what is necessary in the creation of a life form in this mm -hmm. instance. Um, all things in creation begin as involutionary constructs mm -hmm. and they cross over to yes, become sir evolutionary constructs 
involution has to do strictly with the involving of substance and how substances, even chemical substances, are actually created. Mm -hmm. So whatever substances we're talking about in the world, uh, oxygen, hydrogen, whatever it is, they had to first have their involutionary stages so that the necessary materials that we would then use on this evolutionary side must first be completed. And in a uh, paraphrase of what it is you're saying, uh, you have to become whole before you can actually um, contribute to that and those who are outside of you, giving the best example of that as the infant in gestation within his or her mother's womb. They are experiencing levels of involution. Involution is developing quantities. Right. Mm -hmm. Evolution, on the most part, is developing qualities. Yes, yes, sir. That's so it. when the baby is born, the doctor doesn't want to know what grade it went to while it was in its mother's womb, how smart it is, how how loving and caring it is. It has nothing to do with those qualities. The doctor strictly wants to know about quantities. Does he have both of his arms, yes. both of his legs? Are his two eyes in the right place? Mm -hmm. You see? Is anything blocking his nasal passages? So, uh, you know, he looks at his navel. He wants to make sure that the umbilical cord and whatnot is not wrapped around his neck, you know, and that kind of thing. So the uh, the medical professional is looking at quantities of things. He's going to count those fingers and make sure that they're five in total. He's going to count those toes, make sure the same, mm -hmm. right? He's going to make sure he doesn't have an eye in the middle of his forehead like Cyclops. So the doctor is looking for quantities of things two ears are the ears the same size you know this is running all of the way through the doctor's mind as the, he examines this child in the first minute of this child's entrance into this life once the child begins to breathe on his or her own then we start to look for qualities now if the baby is crying which most if not all babies do when they exit the womb the doctor knows that the baby is only supposed to cry until its needs are met. So if the baby is cold because where he's coming from was a warm environment and the doctor's room or the delivery room or the living room, wherever this baby happens to be born, is a little bit on the chilly side, that's going to bother him because the temperature is substantially different. So the baby's going to cry. The baby's going to come here more than likely hungry because it was feeding on its mother's um, insides, you know, through her umbilical cord, he was being fed also, not through a, a fork and a knife and a spoon, which he would do on this side of the life, but on that side of the life, the involutionary side of the life, those uh, the, the, quant the, the quantity that he needed was simply the amniotic fluid and the other compositions of things that Allah created on the inside mm -hmm. for his or her involutionary development. But once it comes here, and it begins to cry. And if it keeps on crying after the breast has been put in his mouth and after the swaddling cloth has been placed around him and after all of these things that the doctors know are normally supposed to placate that infant, then the doctor knows that there's something above and beyond the normal that we need to start looking at and looking for in order to make this baby as comfortable on the evolutionary side of the scale as possible. So we begin looking at his feelings. Why is he feeling that way? And feelings are evolutionary. Uh, feelings are qualitative as opposed to quantitative. We don't want to know how much cry the baby does. We want to know why or what the reason is for the baby crying, even if it's for two minutes as opposed to 20 minutes, right? So <clears throat> what we're looking for is quality on, on that level. And this is a very important message for human beings worldwide. This has nothing to do with race, ethnicity, right. gender, or anything. What right. we're discussing now has to do with what we would go on to call the quality of human life, the quality. Mm -hmm. We have been tricked. And just going back to your original points about Iblis and Shaitan and what's going on, you know, on that level of language, 
and language manipulation really is what you're talking about. We are uh, we 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 have been tricked into seeing almost the totality of our lives in qualitative measures. Yes. Now, pardon me, quantitative measures. Quant yeah. Yes. Quant We're looking at our life in terms of how much money we got, how big is our house, can we get a new car next year? You know, quanti uh, quantities of things. Mm -hmm. So what we're really doing is without realizing it, we're consigning ourselves to the involutionary side of our development. Sure. Where things are taking on more and more quantities. Yes, sir. But mm -hmm. we never get to the quality. So we got a bunch of people in this world right now, I'm not just talking about African Americans. Right. We got That's a bunch right. of people sitting at the top echelons of government and religion and these other areas, education, and mm -hmm. their major concern is quantities of things. Right. How much more money can we get? Mm -hmm. How much can we milk the government for in this new proposal of ours? You know, uh, how much land can we grab? You know, that was the objective of the original English settlers who came here and thought enslaving Africans was a good idea. <laughs> what, what were they enslaving? They weren't enslaving people who they saw as qualities. They were enslaving people who they deemed to be quantities of things, Me measurements, money, interest. Mm -hmm. See, so when that happens, the point is, is that we have actually slid backwards on the scale of evolution. We've stunted our growth in terms of true human evolution. We've retarded our growth in terms of our true mental ability to grow and uh, uh, evolve mentally. We're supposed to be evolving mentally. We're at a point now. Wally Udin, we're, we're supposed to be able to look at something and have it happen the way we're looking at it, the way we're imagining it. We're at a point where we're supposed to imagine ourselves in a particular situation and that thing is supposed to, mm -hmm. as Allah says in the Quran, kun fayakun. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, but we, we haven't advanced into that uh, recognition yet because there's been a scheme, a foul and a foot that is designed to keep us flatlined. Yes. In terms of our evolution and becoming overgrown in terms of our satiation relative to material things. Now, this has happened more for the African-American community than it has happened for most other communities, but it is actually a worldwide phenomenon. Um, and the only ones who are not really able to take advantage of this, this, this uh, thirst that they may have for more and more material things are poor people. Because they don't have access to resources. So in order to correct this issue, we have to go back to its root. Mm -hmm. And its root is in this focus that we have, this unnatural, non fitra based focus on the material world That's right. and the purpose of the material world. That's right. There's supposed to be a balance mm -hmm. between... Um, what Allah calls ad dunya, the material world, and al akhirah, mm -hmm. that which is supposed to evolve out of the material world into something that the material world can no longer contain. And that growth and evolution happens first in this physical life mm -hmm. while we are engaged in this dunya. Mm -hmm. And it is supposed to spiral out of that into a whole nother platform of existence that the material world is not in control of. So as I said, if I can imagine myself engaged in something or obtaining something or going somewhere or meeting with certain people, and I can do all of that from my mind, from my imagination, and before long, you see it appear, you see it happen, kun fayakun be, and it becomes, as Allah says in the Quran, see, then I'm, I'm operating on my human level now. I'm operating based on my human potential. And most people are blind to or actually don't know anything about that potential. So they go on thinking that they're living in life. Mm -hmm. yes. When in fact, they're just surviving. Yeah. Most people are just in survival mode, which goes back to what you said, because survival mode is a part of the reptilian brain's activity. Now, I want to make a, a just a little minor um 
change, or I might even call it a correction in what you said mm. about the reptilian brain. As you know, I've been teaching on lately information pertaining to the cerebellum right. brain. They call that the hind brain. Mm. And what we need to recognize is that these parts of the brain are not um, like singular, unique, and differentiated in the way that we think they are. They all are actually cooperating with each other as yes. Allah intended to do. Everything Allah created is designed for what's called Tawheed. Yes. Definitely. Right? Uh, to work together, to find a way to work together in unison, in unity, in oneness. So even fire and water, as opposite as they are as elements in the fitwa, fire and water work together because the fire can come and, yes. you know, disintegrate mm -hmm. the water huh. or it can just heat up the water or mm -hmm. it can cause the water to become steam yes. right the coldness of the weather could cause the water to become ice mm -hmm. so these elements are working together because Allah commanded them to work together um, so um, what we're saying here is very important for understanding human growth and development mm -hmm. the cerebellum yeah also has a control over human emotionality mm -hmm. so when you match what the cerebellum does in terms of emotionality with what the limbic brain is doing in terms of its attachment to feelings and emotionality you might say well what's the difference the difference is that one is more concentrated mm -hmm. what's going on in the cerebellum is connected to what's going on in the heart complex or the reptilian brain. Mm -hmm. So people say, well, reptiles don't have feelings. Well, I recently discovered that they absolutely do. <laughs> Those feelings are not made manifest like animals' feelings are made manifest or like human feelings are made manifest. But the snakes and the iguanas and the turtles, et cetera, they certainly do have feelings, but they're more um, ground, I would say grounded. Mm -hmm. And they work together. Yeah. So this is why in the Bible, for instance, you have the serpent in the garden in the book of Genesis speaking to Eve, mm -hmm. not to Adam, not to the thinking brain, mm -hmm. but to the, the emotional memory brain, the limbic brain that you spoke about. The serpent is that reptilian brain but just remember that the reptilian brain has a relationship with the cerebellum brain, mm -hmm. that right. lower stem, that lower brain stem that's controlling your instinctive uh, operations, mm -hmm. right? But they're working together. Mm -hmm. You have the, the, the hind brain, right? right? And it's connected directly to that lower chamber that connects to the Spinal. Uh, the spinal cord, yeah, which is registering your nervous system and your feelings, generally speaking. So right. I, ho I hope I'm being understood. The way yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I don't have the pictures in front of me to show show the diagram to you or to anybody else. But just understand that all of it uh, is interchangeable, but they exist in different measures. The emotions of the cerebellum are different than the emotions of the feelings that are being registered by the limbic brain now the limbic brain has something that the cerebellum doesn't have mm -hmm. the limbic brain also controls memory mm -hmm. so it controls emotions and memory mm -hmm. and the things that it chooses to remember are going to be based on the things that have the most emotional impact right so we remember the death of a loved one mm -hmm. we remember a horrific car crash we remember our wedding day or the day our baby was born you know because these things hold tremendous emotional impact and value for us so we tend to hold on to those things in what is called the long-term memory bank yes. mm -hmm. now a lot of people don't realize that the the um cerebrum the the uh, cerebral cortex the mm -hmm. neocortex the mm -hmm. thinking brain mm -hmm. the brain that's making more rational decisions <clears throat> it also has memory mm -hmm. but the difference between the memory in the top brain and the middle brain is that the top brain's memory is very short term mm -hmm. is for remembering things 
uh, you know, like people used to say, yo, what's your number, man? I don't have a pen and paper, man. Why, I'm going to say it to you, man. Just try to remember it. Try to remember it. So you're thinking about it all the way home, all the way home. Then you write it down when you get home, right? And then it's out of your brain. You forgot it. Somebody asked you that night, what's that number again? And you, you won't remember because it was relegated to the short-term memory. It's not even a bank. It's like a, like a, a like a, what do you call that? Uh, you know, the cash machine when you go, you know, like an M M <laughs> ATM, it's like an ATM. <laughs> you don't go there to do your real banking business. You know, when you want to open up a business or something, you don't go to the ATM and start messing with it. You go inside to the real bank, right? right. All right. So it's the same thing with the brain. It has short-term memory. You go to a movie, you remember that movie. Or, for instance, to give you a better uh, example, dreams. Right. If you don't make a conscious effort to remember a dream, as soon as you wake up and you write it down or tell somebody about it, 10 you minutes can't, later. Can't recall it. Can't, can't recall it. Yeah. You understand? So these are the intricacies of how Allah has created this brain to operate. And the Quran, in my last statement on that point, and I'll hand it back to you, the Quran is the number one script or scripture for identifying what's necessary to take these parts of the human structure and uh, catapult them, if you will, mm -hmm. into areas of uncharted waters, yes. uncharted possibilities for this human brain and for this human heart and for these human instincts. We're supposed to be way past where we are now in terms of time and evolution. Yes. But that Shaitan fella that you mentioned, mm -hmm. operating with his chief, uh, his chief officer, Iblis. Mm -hmm. It's not that they are actually evil in terms of how we think about evil. That's right. If they are evil, they're necessary evils mm -hmm. because they are your challenge position that necessary they are the muscle building materials just like you feel that 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 acid building up in your muscles when you exercise or over exercise you feel what they call the burn the burn is not related to satan and hellfire and all of that well that has to happen if your muscles are going to grow right so our focus then is not so much on shaitan in fact you know, the majority of the Quran is not speaking about what shaitan is doing. He's, Allah just gives us enough on shaitan to know what to look out for. Mm -hmm. You know, he's looking at you from perches that you can't see, you know, that kind of thing. You know, he's letting you know how he's operating. He's got a crew of people, shayatheen. These are humans mm -hmm. who are operating based on the shaitan frequency. Mm -hmm. Shaitan is a frequency. Shaitan yeah. is not an individual. Shaitan is a frequency that is uh, being employed in a way to control factors and factions of your life. Right. Yeah. So shaitan will operate through people. Mm -hmm. That's the only way he can really reach us. He can't reach us simply as an influence. He has to operate through a vessel. Mm -hmm. And the vessel in this case is going to be humans. And this is how you get a pharaoh. A pharaoh. Mm -hmm. This is how you get a governmental ruler or leader or even a religious head who's operating on the shaitan frequency. And that's when, how, how do you know it's shaitan? Because things begin to crumble. Shaitan's number one uh, mm, tool is he's got like a, a kind of jackhammer that he mm -hmm. comes at people with. And before you know it, you think he's doing some innocent work and, he, and before you know it, your whole foundation is crumbled. Mm -hmm. That's how you know him. Your family life is dissipating and disappearing. Your marriage is breaking up. You and your neighbors are fussing and fighting every other day. That's how you know shaitan is in it. Mm -hmm. And the only way to get around that is by employing the guidance of Al-Quran in this case for us as Muslims. Christians and Jews, they can say something else if they want to. Or they can come enjoy the fruits of the Quran also because it's a book for everybody, not just for Muslims. All right? So... Look at the world, and if the world is cracking up and dissipating, and they even had a drug out at one point, and mainly the African American community called crack, they mm -hmm. do this on purpose. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have to do what's necessary to uh, fix the cracks, mend the cracks, 
put glue into the crevices of those cracks so that they can then begin to operate again as one. So I'll let you take it from there. Okay, great, great. So <clears throat> uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking about uh, one of the points that you were making in terms of uh, how uh, this, what we call uh, Satan uh, or Shaitan, how it is, in fact, a frequency. Uh, it's a mentality. And we, you know, make a tremendous error when we try to identify them in terms of people or, you know, a certain uh, classes of people. Because <clears throat> um, I think of, and I want to ask you this question. When I think about, you know, something that uh, the Fitra, how everything in the Fitra has form and function. And when I think of uh, the form, I'm thinking about something that has, uh, in the form, a need is expressed. And in the function, there is activity that satisfy that need uh, for itself or for others. Because, you know, that to me, that is that balance between form and function. Because everything has need. And then to me, a need is a imbalance requiring the necessary frequency uh, to restore balance. Yeah. So when we look at um, it, what I what, what uh, started out with this uh, African American experience or this slavery uh, system that was created in America, um, it was it goes back to something that we talked about in our last session: consonants and dissonance, because um, the system of slavery was designed to bring about, you know, within the individual and really throughout the whole of human society, a dissonance uh, based on the language environment or corrupt language environment that was created. Because there's no way, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I was thinking in, in the same regard that really uh, from the enslaved and their descendants, they really have an advantage. And the advantage is that we know that we have been wounded and we know that we've been made sick. Whereas a lot of other people don't know that they have been just as wounded, if not more, from the same corrupt language environment. Because they bought into it in order to implement this scheme, they had to buy into it. And, and so the blessing for us is that um, now we are more motivated to find those uh, avenues or doors to uh, get out of this rabbit hole, to get out of this scheme. And I think uh, what, uh, uh, going back to another point that you made, uh, and you were the only one that I know that really honed in on this point that was made by Imam Muhammad, and that was the great elimination of the human soul. So there's been this concerted effort to wipe out the human soul. And so we have been blessed in that uh, our uh, interest and our motivation is to really uh, come into an understanding of how to revive and reestablish that connection with our true self, with our soul that the that, that lost uh, or the, the source creator has uh, established. So uh, what, what is your thought, you know, on, on that, on that point? I would think. Yeah, those are great points. <clears throat> and, uh, the great elimination of the human soul is something that has been taking place over a protracted period of time. Mm -hmm. And its major concentration has been on the land that we live in and love called America. Yes. There's been no other place on planet Earth that has been more targeted mm -hmm. by this 
effort to eliminate the soul yes. than America. Mm -hmm. In fact, the word America is not <clears throat> actually based on the explorer Amerigo Vespucci, as they've told us, the Italian explorer. Mm -hmm. They use his name as a cover up, as mm -hmm. a screen. Um, how could this land be named after him? And not only this land, but South America, two continents mm -hmm. out of seven, mm -hmm. named right. after a person who the average school child couldn't tell you anything about if you asked him. As important as he's supposed to be, his name went on to this continent and the, and the other continent south of us. What do we know about him? The average school child Maybe even the average college student wouldn't know much about Amerigo Vespucci to be able to justify us having named two continents after him. Mm -hmm. All right. Then they got the whole thing about the Christopher Columbus thing and there's a whole lot of stuff coming out about him that would make you less than proud to associate with his name. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but it's a cold word. As we know, the Freemasons were extremely involved in the institution of these lands and their governmental structures and systems. And uh, it's a Freemason code hidden within the name America because the name America is a combination of two languages and two concepts. The first is Amir, A-M-I-R, mm -hmm. which is an Arabic word, as you know, and it means prince or ruler. Okay, ruler over what? That's where the ka comes in, which originally was ka, mm. because they got this concept out of ancient Egypt and one of their names for the soul. Mm. The ancient Egyptians have a concept that involves seven levels of the soul. Yes. Uh, pardon me, nine levels mm -hmm. of the human soul, with the bottom level, the foundational level, being what they called ka. Mm. Mm. Yes. All right. So Ka in ancient Egyptian language is actually a level of the soul, the fundamental or the foundational level of the soul, the one that's concerned with this material dunya we've been talking about. So Amir Ka means prince of the soul, ruler of the soul. Mm. So that's what this land was intended to be as the great experiment, which many of the forefathers called it. America is the great experiment. And we're seeing that experiment to come to one of its fruitions as we speak in the world right now, 2024. Mm -hmm. the, the, the collapsing in on itself. Yes. In terms of what's going on in the government, in education, in mm -hmm. the culture, people being confused about gender. What is a woman? I can't explain what a woman is but I right. want to be a judge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they asked the judge, what is a woman? And she couldn't answer. But she wants to be a judge. What in the hell is she going to be able to judge if she can't even judge what a male and a female is and explain it to you in rational terms? Mm -hmm. So this is the quagmire that we have been foisted into in our day and time. Mm -hmm. America is dealing with the the rulership over the human soul. So there were people obviously in positions of power who were ruling and regulating the soul. Mm -hmm. And those people have been in areas of finance. <clears throat> they have been in areas of academics. They have been in areas of the culture. They have been in areas of, um, did I say education already? If I no. didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they've been in all of these vital arteries. Mm -hmm. And it's been through the manipulation of the language that you mentioned in the beginning, in all of these areas, because you can't have an effort that's not attached to language. It has to be able to express its concerns. So we know that even in uh, medicine, they have medical ease. In economics, they have financial terms. And they'll be the same terms that you normally use, but they mean something different. So those in the audience, if you want to know more what I'm talking about, get yourself a copy of what is called the Black Laws Dictionary. Black, B-L-A-C-K. It's not a color. Mm -hmm. It's just the name of the dictionary. Black Law 
Dictionary. Mm -hmm. And Black Law Dictionary is going to have terms in there that you are familiar with, mm -hmm. like the term human, mm -hmm. but it's not going to mean what your standard uh, Webster Dictionary or New World Heritage Dictionary means when you look up the word human. Mm -hmm. Black Law Dictionary is going to say that human means monster. Yes. Mm -hmm. Monster. So what's what's going on here? That a major dictionary that is used by people in secret society and used uh, by people who don't want you to know what they're talking about when they talk to each other. They're using terminology that is um, really depreciating the human worth. So if we talk about the depreciation, the dissolution, and the destruction of the human soul, then it must be that it's carried out, it's being carried out, carried out by the dissipation and the dissolution of the language itself. How do we know that? Because the common people in the culture now are using language that 50 years ago we would have frowned upon and fought against. Yeah. We can't even look at the average comedian now without him cussing and fussing at us. And if he doesn't cuss and fuss, nobody wants to go see his comedy show. Right. You understand? And some of these people are very brilliant people. They're intelligent people, but their their moral grasp has dissipated. Yeah. And it's the moral, rational grasp in the human mind that is connected directly to the human soul, what the Quran calls the nefs. Mm -hmm. The nefs is not just a feeling soul. The nefs is also a thinking soul. Yes. You see, it's, a, it's, it's part and parcel of the human intellect also. It makes decisions. Yes. Now, the thing about the nefs is that it's supposed to be making decisions that are in the better interest of all parties involved. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be fair. It's supposed to be just as Allah created it. But when the false language of this world begins to interfere with the proper development of the nefs, then the language that the nefs begins to register is the language that is designed specifically to reduce it in worth, that mm -hmm. quality that we spoke about earlier. Right. It doesn't care how much qu quantity you have, mm -hmm. as long as the quality begins to dissipate and the quality is going to definitely affect the functionality of the soul mm -hmm. to the point where the soul becomes confused and eventually the soul will fall and fail. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking at now when we look at people living in our own homes, when we look at the people next door and what they're into, mm -hmm. when you look at what's going on in the schools mm -hmm. and the school administration, we're looking at people whose souls have failed Mm -hmm. and are falling quick into dissolution, into disarray, into confusion. People are truly, truly confused. Yes. Confusion is a clinical term, you know. Yes. It's a medical term. Mm -hmm. If you get extreme diabetes or some other of these diseases, they say that you reach a level in the mind where you become confused. Mm -hmm. You know where you are. But you don't know where you are. You know where you are, but you don't know how to get to where you're going. And where you're going might be just next door. Mm -hmm. That's confusion. And that's what has happened to the average mind. So we have to reestablish the true meanings of terminology. So that human becomes what it was originally intended to be. Humus mind. A mind that is operating with a soil content that is being influenced by rain and streams without becoming muddy, you know, just influence, just sprinkle the little dab of dooya, as they say. Mm -hmm. Allah says that uh, sometimes uh, there's a tremendous downpour of water, and he said, and then some other times, light moisture suffices, and that's how some of us are, mm -hmm. you know? We don't always have to be talked to like we are moral idiots. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can just come to us with a little bit of the truth, and the person says, that sounds right, Mr. Bilal. And you can even do this with children. There are children who are smart enough and swift enough to know right from wrong. And all you have to do is come to them with a little correction on what they did that might not have been right. And they agree with you. And Mr. Blau, yeah, I'm going to try that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try that. That sounds like it might work for me. See? So we have to pay more attention to language construct. Because whatever you pay attention to is going to expand. 
it's going to get bigger before you. So if we're paying attention only to what Satan is doing, then Satan will be the overruling influence in our life. That's right. Like it or not. So I don't pay attention that much to Satan. I just look out for his traps. Yes. But I don't I don't I don't spend hours on Satan. Mm -hmm. And uh just to go back to the beginning of this conversation, and you said that uh Satan's last stand. I like that. Satan should have a last stand in each one of our lives. We should say, as of tonight, you know, like Custard's last stand. Right. <laughs> We're going to surround this chump, Satan, from all sides. He surrounded us from all sides, didn't he? Yes, sir. So he did to us what, General, what, what happened to General Custard with the Indians, so-called Indians. They surrounded him at the last moment. <laughs> there's no way for him to turn. That's how you have to be with Shaitan. Make it so that there's no entryway for him. No more portal, no more door, no more negotiating, none of that with what you clearly know to be wrongdoing. Yes. But in the Quran, in the ayat that you mentioned, and in a different video, we'll talk about the difference between shaitan and iblis, because there's a clear difference. Right. Yes. Clear difference. All right. Allah says, out of the mouth of iblis, as you said, that because you have put me out, I'm going to lie and wait for them, meaning your folk, your elite, mm -hmm. your dedicated ones. I'm going to lie and wait for them on your straight path. How bold is that? Very bold. Yeah, you're talking to Allah. He said, I'm going to, but see, he's not, he ain't talking out loud. <laughs> you know what would have happened if your children had said out loud what they were thinking? When they were looking at you yes. and you were fussing at them, mm -hmm. man, you would have slapped the taste out of their mouth <laughs> if they had said it out loud. So this conversation uh, giving us Iblis's thoughts are just his thoughts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you right. can't get away with talking to Allah like that. Right. Uh, so he's saying, I'm, I'm going to be lying on your straight path right. to make sure that these folks don't make it to your destination. Yeah. All right. So this is what we have to be aware of. As you said, the word um, is related to this phrase, and that, that's what they're translating as uh, lying in wait. But it literally is sitting mm. in wait. Mm -hmm. See? Satan, 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 yes. sitting. Yes, all of that. Yes. All right. So this influence, this frequency mm -hmm. has made a home in your house. Right. Because God, uh, there are two types of sitting, mm -hmm. essentially. And both of them are given in this ritual prayer that they give us. Yes. So this one is God. Uh, it means to sit. And the other one is uh, jealous. Uh, mm hmm which is sitting that almost looks exactly like God there, but here's the difference. God there is when we are sitting in private, the privacy of our own concerns, the privacy of our own homes with the people that we know and love and share with. Mm -hmm. Literally, that's God there. Mm -hmm. And you can sit there as long as you want to. Mm -hmm. As long as there's nothing else urgent that you have to, you can sit there. But it's also positioning in the mind. Mm -hmm. It's also positioning in how you um, uh, tend to your thoughts. Right. And a lot of ideas can sit in the mind mm -hmm. and not want to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. In the mind of the Ku Klux Klan man, he doesn't want racism to go anywhere. Okay. He, he has invited that into his mind to sit for as long as it feels comfortable and justified. See? Mm -hmm. For the pervert, perversion, child molestation, wife beating, all of that sits as almost like permanent furniture. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, that kind of furniture that when you go look to try to move it, it's, it's nailed into the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's what they do. But then you can also have uh, permanent fixtures in the mind that are based on good, good things, mm -hmm. good ideas. So that's the first one. It's a private sitting. The second one, jalousa, is when you get the word majlis, where groups of people come together to sit. Mm -hmm. 
you might, you know, we, we're used to thinking majlis is just for the masjid, you know, when we come together to make a decision. No, majlis is any group of people in a group for us is three people or more. Doesn't have to be a thousand people, 400 people. No, it can be three or more makes a plural in Arabic. Mm -hmm. So if we go to the movie theater and sit with other people who are sharing our interest in that film, that's a majlis sitting. If we're in school and there's a group of students in the same classroom or in the same auditorium and we're sharing the same interests, listening to the same speaker or looking at the same film in the auditorium, science or whatever the film is on, that's a majlis. So majlis is always a public sitting. So look at the contrast now. Ada, private sitting. Majlis, jalsa, public sitting. That's why in Jalisa, which is the first sitting in the ritual prayer, you don't stay there that long. Can I interrupt you just one second? Please. What you just said um, reminds me of something in, naturally in the human brain called the reticular activation system. Yes, sir. Which in that sitting, uh, we are then looking for anything that we can find to justify what we're thinking. Mm hmm which have to explain the uh, fervor to justify uh, what we have been told is right about the ritual prayer and every other ritual thing that we do that has no real um, benefit. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, when you look at the construction of this cerebellum that I was talking about as it attaches itself to the spinal cord, the lower brain. And you look at it in that Arabic glyph called Aleph that you mentioned. There's Aleph, which is the spine. And then there's that little thing that looks like the top half of the letter uh, Ayn. Right. In another instance, we call it Hamza. Mm -hmm. right? But they call Aleph the chair mm -hmm. for Hamza. Mm -hmm. So if it's the chair for Hamza, what is the Hamza doing? Mm -hmm. It's sitting. Right. Right. Yes. Right. So it, it's the same concept. Yeah. Yes. It's sitting and, and it's sitting, it's sitting forever, sitting for longevity. So it's in Qada in your brain. Mm -hmm. So now right. we can see why this is the perfect positioning to plan, whether that planning is for the good. Well, that planning is for the not so good. That's the part of the brain that we need to address. You cannot defeat evil in this world by addressing the conscious brain. Mm -hmm. The conscious brain is designed to manipulate, to lie, to cheat, to mm -hmm. subvert, to do all of the things necessary to take you out of the way of being able to influence it emotionally, rationally, it's the business mind. When you go into that business meeting, it's hook or crook. I have to I have to close this deal. I don't care what I have to say. See, that's the mind of the businessman, but that's your moral and rational mind speaking. That's your neocortex at work. Right. Allah calls it nasia. Mm -hmm. Allah says that he's going to grab some people by the nasia. Right. And they translate it in Yusuf Ali's translation as for, uh, forelock. Man, simple for <laughs> <laughs> that joker right there that, right. Four, that four brain boy I tell you that's right. what's going to be grabbed because that's what's causing all of the problems now mm -hmm. he, uh, interestingly enough Allah said he, he didn't say he was going to grab him by the cerebellum mm -hmm. he didn't say I'm going to snatch him by the reptile brain because the reptile brain is not evil in and of itself it's doing what Allah created it to do help you survive mm -hmm. but the reptile brain has to send messages up to, 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 to the CEO, CEO for his approval. Yeah. And that's where we go wrong because when it reaches the moral and rational chamber, that's the area of leadership in you that's opposed to yay or nay that decision based on what you know to be right, wrong, good, bad, clean, filthy. Yeah. So when you don't make that modification or that um, correction, then you, as the conscious thinker, become responsible. It won't be your limbic brain on trial in the judgment. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. your feelings. Your feelings are blind. Mm -hmm. It won't be your reptile brain that's on the judgment chair in the judgment. Right. It's only it's only going to be the part of your creation that is responsible for moral and rational thinking, moral thinking and rational implementation and application of the moral thought once you come to a moral conclusion. But the moral conclusion can be incorrect. This is what we have to understand. Just because we apply the word moral to it doesn't mean it means good. Mm -hmm. The moral right. majority are called moral. Right. Right. Some of the political chicanery that they've established is ridiculous. Racist yeah. as you can be, sexist mm -hmm. as you can be. So the word moral itself is one that we should even shy away from using. Decent. Imam Muhammad actually said to replace the word moral with the decent. Yes. So are you the decent majority? Mm -hmm. Is your mind operating on decent value, decency, and rational implementation of that which you find to be decent? And what is decent? Decent is related phonetically to the word descent. Mm -hmm. Not from the same language group even, but it's related phonically, right. sound-wise. Decent? Descent is clear that they're both really from the same place, wherever that is. So what is decent? The ability to act accordingly, to act correctly. See? So and what what is descent? Descent is where you come from. Mm -hmm. That's right. So understanding nunetics gives us an advantage because we can say that where we come from, wherever that is, however far back that is, you say Adam, though somebody else says procreate magnum man or pro magnum or whatever, you know, whatever they say we came from, it was a place of decency. Mm -hmm. That's right. And Margaret Mead established that. That's right. Yeah. She said, as an anthropologist, that the oldest people that she came across in her travels in her study of ancient people, of primordial people. She said many of them didn't even have words in their vocabulary for evil. Yes, that's right. You, you understand? They didn't have the word. Like we have a bunch of words and not weak. We have a whole dictionary on evil words. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. You know, but she said that they didn't even know what you're talking about when you talk, when you're trying to describe what hate is. Yes. Or, you know, racism. I mean, what is racism? In, in, in the Amazon? Really? Amongst those tribes? No, no such thing. So it shows you that ancient people, primal people, we don't want to say primitive, we want to say primal people, people who were on the earth first, doing what was necessary to establish survival uh, tools, how to make a fire, you know, all of that stuff that we say primal people did. Okay, well, all of what they did ended up being decent. Yes. Even if they had to defend themselves against some unruly tribe mm -hmm. that they came upon, but on the most part, they weren't fighting like that amongst each other. Mm -hmm. That had to be instigated. So human life is that. And you really don't even have to go into the pages of Margaret Mead's work to understand what human beings were on the primal level, because every time a human baby is born, you we see. get a chance to witness that history all over again. Mm -hmm. So the baby is not born cussing and fussing if it's a need to being taken care of, if it's being treated correctly. In fact, there are children who are not treated correctly, children who are being molested as we speak, who are still in love with their caretakers, their yeah. mommy, and she beats the baby. The daddy, he holds the child upside down by his legs, and he's just cruel. He's inhuman. He's a monster for real. But that baby will still cling and, and protect. And just like you've seen the prostitutes out here get beat up by their pimps and they love those pimps. They won't, they won't leave those pimps. There's mm -hmm. something in human nature that says that I'm going to stick with what I know <laughs> right. instead of take a chance on the unknown. That's right. I know I'm going to get beat up tonight when Superfly yeah. gets home. Yeah. So I've conditioned myself to be used to it. I'm used to getting beat. Sometimes they even anticipate getting beat. Isn't that crazy? Let's get this over with. But they're going to stick with that John. They're going to stick with that pimp. You got it? But that's in the human nature. But that's, a, that's one of those things that has been twisted and contorted based on false language concerning who the person is, self-image, self-view, and who the person who they're engaged with. 
who he or she is. When you start thinking that he is an ilah, that's when it all falls apart. So the Qur'an's coming to us with la ilaha illallah, that there is nothing worthy of you giving your devotional attention to. That's an ilaha. You're giving your, it's a verb, it's not a noun. So we need to stop saying no God except God. Mm -hmm. That's not what it says. Ilahun, you could say God. Ilaha is, a, is an intensified verb. That means uh, that this, is, this has become the object of your focus. Mm -hmm. It has become the primary object of your attention, just like your child can become your God because you give it attention. But if you give it too much attention and you give it attention all of the time, even when it's not calling for attention, it's sleeping. You're going in there still looking at it and you know, tucking it in after you've tucked it in three times already. And you give that kind of inordinate attention to, to the baby. The baby has become your ilah one mm -hmm. because you're giving ilaha to that child. Right, so that proclamation had to come. La ilaha illallah, that there is nothing worthy of you giving that level of devotional attention to. There's only Allah, or except for Allah, there's only Allah who you're supposed to give that level of attention to, because whatever you give your attention to expands. So if we want Allah to expand in our lives, over our lives, and regulating our lives supervising our lives, taking over our lives, and we have to give Allah more attention. How do we do that? By going outside and looking at the sun? Oh, that must be my Rabb, like Ibrahim was supposed to have done. No, you do it by going into the guidance and giving the guidance your attention. And the guidance of the Quran is going to expand yes. until it begins to encapsulate you, invigorate you, quicken you. Yes. Every day, not sometimes, every time you Think about what's in the Quran. It's going to give you that chill, that 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 fervor to say, "I can, I can conquer this thing. I can be this thing. I can defeat this scheme." But if you're not in touch with the Quran, only once a year during Ramadan, superficially, or in your superficial ritual prayers, and you know you think you're being in contact with Allah by just reciting al Fatiha and you know the shortest surahs you can remember, you're in trouble. Yes, that's right. I'm going to give you the final words. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I like to uh, say that <clears throat> uh, end up with this. Uh, there's a Quranic uh, verse, or ayat, that states, I think it starts with kalla, kalla, uh, and it goes to say that he that you have favored above me, if you give me respite, source creator, I will mislead all of them save a few. Mm -hmm. Now, I think uh, that that word based on mimetics, color, is what was being said was coming from the subconscious. You know, and that speaks to what you've talked about, how the subconscious is really where most of the problems lie. Mm -hmm. And and so um, the what what is what is we are seeing uh, in the world is that uh, those people who uh, are part of that mindset of you know slave making mm -hmm. uh, how they you know they they really exist in ranks or in layers. Because you have a, a great um, part of the leadership of people who, particular, uh, call themselves religious leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, who uh, going back to what uh, is said in that ayah that uh, he will uh, establish himself, you know, on that sarat, on that up in God's way. Yeah. And and so I think it's so important for us. As, as you pointed out, to uh, begin to uh, think seriously about the language that we are using and uh, how much of the, the, this language really reinforces, you know, the scheme of shaitan or the schemes, 
you know, of the devil, whatever you want to, you know, phrase it. And it's very important. I, I cannot uh, say enough about, you know, how lunatics uh, and this system has impacted my personal life yeah. in terms of, you know, what I, the way I think, um, you know, what I'm willing to give my time to and my mind to. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll just, you know, like to you know, end this conversation with putting that, um, you know, out as uh, really what's important to us. Um, I, as I opened up, I believe that, you know, Allah allowed us to experience what we experience so that we could then um, see all of that, everything that you mentioned and everything that we know that has gone on in the history of the human being. We have seen it really come to, you know, uh, a culmination. And, uh, you know, Imam Muhammad uh, said that, you know, this is a day of conclusion. Uh, this is a day where, uh, I mean, the human being, if you, you think about uh, what's going on with, with AI and all the other things that are uh, impacting and influencing the human life, we are really seeing uh, some uh, things that are uh, really tremendous. And so <clears throat> uh, it's important that we uh, really dig deeper in ourselves to, you, you know, understand or uh, to really get to know, you know, ourselves and, and that, you know, evolution and every process that is necessary for us to become whole again is so, so vital and important. Uh, and, and, and not uh, over, uh, emphasizing or putting our uh, attention on somebody out there, you know, where, that we're relying on to give us direction. Mm. But first we must, you know, uh, it is our commitment, our personal commitment to uh, stand up. I heard, I, I end with it. I, I heard something um, on a short video that says that, you know, we are like people, uh, like a seven foot man drowning in a four foot pool of water. <laughs> and all he needs to do is stand up to save himself. How about that? Yeah. How about that? So, so uh, I end with yeah. that. I so, truly enjoyed this. Alhamdulillah, inshallah, when we pick this back up for part three, we're going to speak uh, more directly to the ayah that you're referring to in terms of uh, Iblis's stated scheme. Yes. And uh, Allah addresses that um, by saying to Iblis and for that matter to Ashaytan that you can lead to destruction whomsoever you can and you can you can do it with your seductive voice. See, so we're getting back to language. Mm -hmm. They're doing it through the seduction that they have constructed within their very voice patterns, the frequencies that are coming out of their mouths in terms of the, the language itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, Allah gave them permission to make assaults. And you understand? With their cavalry, their warfare, yes. and uh, their infiltrate. Mm -hmm. So so the human being is being made war upon. Mm -hmm. And I think I heard Imam Muhammad speak to, 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 to that idea also. He was talking about the war on on the human being. Yes. There's a war taking place on the human mind. Yes. And um, in that famous nursery rhyme of uh, Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> yes. It says Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. And you know, a wall is a great separator. Yes. That's Humpty right. Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men, there's your cavalry and your infantry, right. couldn't put Humpty back together again. We're experiencing that day and time as we speak in this day in the judgment. Yes. 
not the judgment. It's a day in the judgment. Yes, sir. All right. So let us all beware. There are some tumultuous times mm -hmm. in front of us. And there are truly people in the world who are attempting to collapse the world as we know it. Yes. And how you fare at the end of this season is going to be determined by the quality of your thinking and your choice making. And if you have stopped making choices, then you have relegated the leadership over your life to your emotions mm -hmm. and the people who are masters at manipulating emotions will be able to draw you into their camp and persuade you with their voices and their call. Yes. And it's going to be the call that says, how do I survive? And as you said in the beginning, the survival brain is indeed the reptilian brain. So the choice is whether you want to be human, for real, for real, or you want to give way to being a mammal or a beast of the field or part of the cattle, as it speaks about in Surah 6, call the cattle, or whether you want to be a part of the human experience. So thank you, sir, for being with me. Thank you so much. I'm going to go give me some brunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. So this is me just this is me just rolling out of bed i'm, I'm gonna yeah. be pretty good by three o'clock you know we have our main class yes and i'll be sending out the uh i'll be sending right. out the, the link for that uh it's going so, to be on the, we will probably just right. tune in from the uh uh new next class at el Bayou. yeah well, that, that, that would have been that would have been done because this is three that's, that's what i'm saying we will probably tune in because it about to be in from uh the uh, new next class at El Bayou. We probably tune in three o'clock. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. But you guys meet at twelve, though, right? Uh, two. Oh, okay. That's what it. Okay. Okay. It's two. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. Well, if you that do, let me, know, let me know that you're there. All right. <laughs> Everybody in YouTube land a shout. It's going to be on YouTube Live. Yes. 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 Uh, I'll. I'll. A uh, uh, matter of fact, I'll call email Kareem. And yeah. We can do that uh, as a group. Very good. In fact, if he's in a position to open up, let me know. All right. Sounds All right. Good. Give him All right. five minutes, 10 minutes, or whatever he wants to give. All right. Absolutely. All right. I'll see you there. Yes. Yeah, well, you'll be getting yes. the link in a moment. Okay. Okay. Uh, salam. Ah, alaikum salam.